Good morning. All right, Tuesday Chapel doesn't happen often, but we are excited that you're here, and we're more excited that Dr. Joe Kikasola is here. Today he's gonna to be talking about human and eternal examining ourselves through cinema. So give a warm Scots welcome to Dr. Joe Kikasola. Thanks. Thank you everyone. It's so great to be back and so great to have a good crowd on a Tuesday. I realize this is not the typical pattern for you. Um, I am going to start with a clip. If you, were here, uh, if you were here yesterday, you know that this is from a documentary at the Sundance Film Festival called Ten Meter Tower, and it is a documentary. This really happened uh, ten meters up. Background is, is they had a social experiment going on. The filmmakers went around, it, 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 wherever they were in Sweden, uh, I'm not sure which town, and they s grabbed people off the street and said, would you jump off, a, would, would you go up and try to jump off a 30 meter tower if we paid you about 30 bucks? And they got a big group of people who said they were gonna do it, and the film is all the results, right? Uh, there's cameras everywhere, there's microphones everywhere, et cetera. So please play the clip. I think the audio is out of sync in that clip, but uh, anyway, uh, of all, you're going to see more of these vignettes uh, today and tomorrow, uh, as I love this little film, and I think you can just find it on the internet, but don't spoil it if you're going to come tomorrow. Um, of all the scenes in the film, this might be my favorite one. It's not the funniest one, but it's the most human one. Um, I have the impression that I know this woman. Like, I, I, I know who she is, I have some idea of what she's going through. Every decision she makes or doesn't make, I understand. Um, and yet, I don't know anything about her whatsoever. And that's what's so interesting to me about this film and about film in general. And it's this archetypal setup where you're faced with the big decision, right? And, um, and she, she's just like me. She's, she doesn't have the guts. <laughs> she's failed enough in her life to know and really think that she doesn't have it. And honestly, she really, really doesn't until she does. And so there's something really wonderful about how things turn. Like she almost goes down that ladder and then a switch goes off and something or someone takes over for her and it's just pure grace. And I feel that when I watch it. I feel that struggle and I feel the redemption all without knowing a bit about her. And in my talk yesterday, I spoke about how film traffics and experiences, and I think one of the reasons why I know this woman, quote unquote, is I've had those kinds of experiences. And all of it comes rushing back, but it doesn't come rushing back in here. It's my whole body that comes back. And I know what it's like to be teetering on the edge of that, of that uh, precipice, you know. Um, I, I talked about how the best films are going to put you through a tension that you feel between earth and heaven and time and eternity and what Kierkegaard calls the endless striving. That is the nature of being a human being. 
to be temporal, to be human, to be here in the here and now, and yet be straining towards a future that everything could change, including time itself. That's the thing, is we don't really believe we're bound by time, even though we know we are. And maybe that's because we're created with eternity in our hearts, as the scriptures say. It, uh, film reveals the pleasure and pains of our limits, as well as our own powers and abilities, how we feel about them, as well as our aspirations to be healed and to be more than what we are. Now, somebody who understood this really well was the late, great Russian director Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh, you can't really see his picture, it's too dark. Um, this is one book, he wrote a book called Sculpting in Time, and uh, some of his thoughts on filmmaking uh, has been incredibly valuable to me. I think he might be the greatest filmmaker ever. As a film scholar, I'm never supposed to say that, by the way, that's like career suicide, but I really do think he's probably the greatest. Um, he was just a consummate artist whose work never failed to express the human soul directly. He was born and raised in the Russian Orthodox faith, and though his personal faith as an adult was pretty far from conventional, he hung on to something, and I remain convinced that his faith was genuine, however unorthodox his orthodoxy was, and he sought to integrate that faith into every level of his work. And note what he says here. The allotted function of art is not, as is often assumed, to put across ideas or to propagate thoughts or to serve as an example. He wrote this during communist era, by the way, right? So it's really important. He's distinguishing himself from propaganda, which is largely what you knew in the Soviet Union, right? But that's not what art is about. What is art about? The aim of art is to prepare a person for death to plow and harrow his soul, rendering it capable of turning to good. In his view, the best art gives you the sort of experiences that will plow and harrow your soul. And this might be painful, and it might be glorious, and it's very likely to be both of those things. More than that, it will be true, and you'll be left changed. I want to share with you a personal story today. There's many, there's many films that have changed me. I could list the five that kind of really got into me, but I'm just going to talk about one today, the most recent one. This is, uh, this is in that top five in terms of a personal impact on me. I want to share that story with you because it describes what Tarkovsky meant. My soul was plowed and harrowed, and it did render me capable of turning to good. This was just two years ago. I've been a Christian all my life, so I didn't get saved by it, but I got reminded of what it means to be saved. Let me give you a clue to ground you in what's happening here, because the value here is not so much in the dialogue, of which there is very little. Rather, it's the procession of narrative events which you apprehend and understand through your senses, because film's multi-sensory, it appeals on every level. And more often than not, for good aesthetic and psychological and neuroscientific reasons, the royal gateway to our senses is very often not vision, but sound. And sound is kind of the thing that's overlooked in film studies all the time. We don't think about what we're hearing, and that's Vision just takes the mic all the time. It's, it's what obsesses, it's what we remember. But the truth is the sound is what makes it memorable. It just plays an understated role. So I want you to be really attentive to the sound and what you see here and what you behold here. I see, see I even said see, but it's more than seeing, right? This is the story of Ruben, who is a drummer in an avant-garde experimental rock band. His job, as all drummers know, is to be a timekeeper. He does more than that, but that's at least what he does. Please roll the clip. So that's Ruben and Lou, his partner in the band as well as in life, um, says that sound endows the image with a sense of time, a sense of time. You don't really have a sense of time until you get sound with it. It's much more free-ranging at that point. This is backed up by a hundred scientific studies, I can just tell you. Uh, sound is the temporal sense of all your senses the temporal sense par excellence is sound. It doesn't mean you can't perceive t time without sound, it just means it's a lot harder. Your other senses have to work in ways that they're not primarily geared towards, but sound is built for time. This is, and so uh, it's one of the primary ways that we ground ourselves in time. There are other ways to track time, but they're not as natural or foundational. 
What Shion observes is that in the cinema, sound animates the image. It gives its life, and it animates us. How often do we make sounds to ourselves, even when no one is look, listening, right? She's up on top of the platform. I don't have the guts. I don't have the guts. She's, who's, she, who's she talking to, right? We need those sounds to, not just to express ourselves, but to regulate our existence, to reassure ourselves that we exist, to ground ourselves, right? Did you notice how he's asserting his presence? The sound in the opening to the film works as an overwhelming source of incredible, overwhelming power life and vigor and a kind of defiant assertion of his existence. And Rubin, we learn, really needs that. The music is really aggressive because he should be dead. He's a drug addict. We find out he's recovering and he's in recovery and that's why he eats so healthy, right? And that's why he's got a morning routine. He's got the meditation thing down and he's, you know, and oh, that whole sequence is like a metronome, right? The way it's cut, the way he moves, the way things move along, it's all very in control, right? Now, presence and tracking of time are super important <clears throat> as they have been related to each other for centuries. And as long as St. Augustine in his confessions, the fourth century church father was asking himself about time and the question of God, and he found there where this passing stream of time is perceived, there's a great mystery. He asked himself, how is it that we even perceive time and what is it that we are perceiving. And he got to the end of it and he really wasn't sure. <laughs> the answer was, I don't know. I thought I knew, but I don't know. He called the perception of time or the present tense, the distensio. There's this distension of the mind that was somehow able to perceive this passing stream, but still, and this is the key part, keep a stable sense of his own existence, despite all of that changing and passing. And there was even a deeper question at the bottom of that is the self. So here's how it goes. If the time is change, if time is change, and things are always changing, including me, how am I now the same person who thought about time a second ago? Or how about now? Or, or, or how about not right now? How can I be sure I'm the same person? Because we know time has changed and everything just changed in the last second. And, you know, pages and pages later, his answer is, only you know, O oh Lord, <laughs> right? You know, he's kind of left with, how is it possible I'm live in constant change, and yet, how am I not a disaster? And he says, there's a famous uh, phrase that comes up. He says, mihi magna questio, right? Translated, I've become a question to myself. That's the human condition. That's what it means to be a creature of the finite and the infinite, as Kierkegaard said, and we reviewed yesterday. That's what it means to be human and bound by birth, life, and death, and yet have eternity in your heart, is to be, be a question to yourself. Now, that sounds like a recipe for disaster, does it not? And for a lot of people, it is. But Augustine went on to find that the remedy for all that is to be loved by the eternal. The stability in all that is love. It's a claim upon you from a higher power that is not bound to the same time that you are. Your identity, who you are, is held in a timeless space, and no one can take it. Even you can't take it. That's the beautiful truth that Augustine came to. Reuben is not so fortunate, at least in the beginning of the film. Would you please play the clip. So when sound is taken away, the future suddenly and intensely indeterminate. As the gears in his normal clock and our normal clock for regulating time start to slip. Do you notice how different those images felt? Many of them the same image. They just felt like you couldn't quite grasp them. Like they were just a little bit beyond your perceptual reach. Time continues to flow, but it's irregular and it's in a manner that just sort of drifts away from us and it leaves us behind. Now, there's a whole formative phenomenology to sound. Um, it pours into you. This is what the theorist Walter Ong called an intimate sense, that is a corporeal or body sense. The same sound waves that burst from that drum that Reuben hits with all of his might ripple through you if you hear it live, right? It's a mystery, right? There's a whole thing right here. But typically when you hear something, something rumbled, and those same sound waves that came from that thing 
resonate inside of you. Your body has a connection to that thing, physically, materially. It, so you're in a kind of experiential communion with the world. You're intimately connected. Um, and it reassures you that something actually did happen and you were a part of it. In your mightiest moments, you made that happen, and sound can make you feel very powerful until it doesn't. What's more, you hear in 360 degrees. So sound, naturally, puts you at the center of the universe, right? You hear behind you, can't do that with sight. You hear behind you, you hear to the side, you hear up, you hear down. You're in the center of the world, and that's normal for you. Imagine how that feeds the ego, right? And imagine when that's suddenly ripped away from you. Uh, all information is pouring towards you when suddenly it's not. What's at stake here, at the minimum, is a kind of control, an anchoring sense taken away. You've lost the control you thought you had. You've lost something of the relief from uncertainty that you had. If you feel uncertain about something, you typically try to grasp it or hear it or knock on it, right? Can't quite do that in the same way. And what's more is there's an ongoing organic dynamic sense of self that you have through hearing. Did you notice how he's trying to hear himself? And he's become a question to himself. Now, if Augustine was a question to himself with normal workings of time, imagine how that mystery is deepened and thrown into chaos when you lose the primary regulator of time that you have, which is your hearing. To lose sound in this film, thanks to its exquisite sound design, which I could talk about for a whole hour, is to feel very, very small and out of control and helpless and humbled. And it's also to feel not a little bit lost. So now when I saw that scene I just showed you, I had to stop. And this is where I want to, the rest of the time, tell you a bit of a personal story. I, st I paused the scene and I couldn't go on. I was too upset. Now, that doesn't happen to me very often. I see a lot of different movies, a lot of different topics, etc. But I just was completely overwhelmed. It was unnerving. So I hit pause, I turned off the film, I sat there kind of shaking, and I didn't go back to the film for a solid week. But I tried again, and I managed to make it through that scene, but then I got to this scene where I lost it all, all over again. If you've never been in a hearing test like that, he's supposed to repeat back the words that he hears. The audiologist is manipulating the volume of, of what he can hear in his headsets, and shortly after that, that it's revealed he's lost over 85% of his hearing. Now, I told myself I wasn't going to do this. <laughs> One of my earliest memories of childhood is an audiology booth just like that. I remember how the headphones hurt my four-year-old head. I remember how they felt. How there was this animatronic monkey puppet thing that the audiologist would trigger behind himself to make me pay attention and not get distracted and to make me laugh when I looked like I was getting confused or upset. And I really was because after endless minutes of him saying things to me, or was he? I had no idea. I couldn't tell half the time. I started to feel like I was very uncertain about myself and the whole nature of the world. And why were the, was the volume so low? Why wouldn't he just talk louder? I remember afterwards asking my mom if I did well on the test, and she reassured me that I did very well, and she was very proud of me, but I could tell she was deeply shaken. And the whole way home in the car, she was fighting tears, and she really did try to hide it, but I knew that I had failed that test, and though I really couldn't understand how. And then she explained to me with great love in her eyes that I, like my father, had a genetic hearing loss. It was confirmed. The genes played themselves out. And yes, I would be living with this the rest of my life. She explained, because she knew and loved my father so well, that I could still do all sorts of amazing things, just like my dad. Many things would be harder for me than they were for other kids. Things that I couldn't fully grasp, especially with other people who were trying to communicate with me. I would have to concentrate. I have to be strong, and I have to do my best. Now, I don't want to over-dramatize this. I'm not deaf. I don't think of myself as deaf. I'm certainly not like the characters in this film. I don't know a word of sign language. 
If you've had conversations with me, you don't have to second guess all those conversations. I heard what you said. Uh, hearing aids really do help me. I got them when I was 30 years old. I'm now 52. But I do read lips more often than even I realize, and I miss words all the time, and I'm constantly piecing together what was probably said to me. I live in the world of probably far more than the average person. And I took an audiologist to explain this to me at 30 years old when I got my first set of hearing aids. That's why I was feeling so tired all the time. A lot of cognitive work goes into conversation for me, especially in noisy environments. So I'm often processing what you just said, and I'm mentally rejoining the conversation a couple seconds later after the joke has passed. I'm fighting the tide and social flow of conversation all the time, and I'm asking questions that have already been asked half the time. It's embarrassing. And the worst is that I often appear like I'm completely out to lunch, but what I'm really do is I'm trying to think about what just happened and how I can stay in the game. Now, I've learned to stuff this down and power through on my own strength and to keep going, and I've managed by God's grace to have a good career. It's very social, and I teach and I deal with people all the time, but it really is a matter of fighting another day, and my hearing's not getting better. And I try not to worry too much about what others think of me or what they might think that I think about them. That's usually the harder thing to manage. Now. Here's the thing, everything I just told you, I don't think I really knew that about myself. I knew it on a certain subconscious level, but it really took this film to bring it to my conscience level, conscious level. All that anxiety, embarrassment, constant exhausting adaptation, I was just carrying it around, and I couldn't bear to face it because it was just too inconvenient. It was all my effort to just kind of stay in the social game Darius Martyr's devastating film helped me to see this, and I, I've become friends with the director and writer, um, and I'm so grateful to him. He, he gave me permission to use these clips. Um, what he helped me see was I'm really not okay with this hearing loss. It bothers me a lot, and I'm not strong, and deep down I'm weak, and I'm afraid, and I know it, and I'm tired and I'm utterly dependent on a thousand things that I cannot control. I didn't realize how much I was leaning on my own illusion of control in the world until it was taken from me, and I saw the illusion for what it was, and I didn't realize how much my hearing loss really does bother me until I saw Riz Ahmed, fantastic actor, stumbling around in a body that was suddenly alien to him. I've become a question to myself indeed. Now, it was searing pain for me to watch this, but it was a good pain because I knew it was a true pain. It was mine to be felt and to be named, and it was my story to tell my Heavenly Father. Did you hear that? It was mine. It's part of my story. And dependence is not the worst thing in the world. In fact, it's a sign of health, not sickness. And this is not the end of the film story or the end of my story, and I'm happy to report that there's other ways of being, Augustine found. The mysteries that reveal you don't have to contr the control that you thought you had, where even time itself falls apart the more you try to understand it, is the moment that you confront your origin, the self that existed before you knew yourself. And you cling to the Creator who gave it to you and who is keeping it for you. Augustine described the thinking about the present time and the self as a kind of continual disillusion of his own existence and a remaking. And if you call out to your Creator, eternity will catch you and remind you of who you are to Him. Now, I don't have time to talk about all the profound and hopeful parts of this film with you right now because it is a magnificent film. I've only gotten you started on it, and I hope you'll see the rest of it. I'll tell you, though, that it brought me back to that fundamental conversation with my mother. Over and over, throughout my childhood, we repeated it. On top of all the challenges my mother believed and now knows completely in glory with all her heart that I will be just fine. Too many people loved me to let me fall or believe that I was worthless. I am very blessed that way, and I don't take it for granted. But most importantly, she explained to me that God is sovereign even as He is loving. And my hearing loss would be the first of many hard things that I wouldn't understand, 
But the greatest mystery, the greatest mystery, and the greatest miracle is one of love, where eternity stepped into time, and in the words of the old hymn, God was born to taste our sadness. Come thou long expected Jesus. Even though it didn't feel like God was loving me by giving me a lifelong hearing deficiency, He would prove His love to me in other ways, ways that wouldn't be possible without that hearing loss, and that's the miracle. Tarkovsky said, I see it as my duty to stimulate reflection on what is essentially human and eternal in each individual soul which all too often a person will pass by even though his fate lies in his hands. He's too busy chasing after phantoms. By not considering all of those things, I was chasing after phantoms in many ways just to survive. But the real life is here. Tarkovsky goes on, in the end, everything can be reduced to the one simple element, which is all that a person can count on in his existence, the capacity to love. That element can grow within the soul to become the supreme factor which determines the meaning of a person's life. My function is to make whoever sees my films aware of his need to love and to give his love and aware that beauty is summoning him. That's what Tarkovsky said his purpose was. I'm standing here to tell you that this is absolutely true about God. He loves me, and if you need to hear this, He loves you. And He loves you through a particular kind of healing beauty that summons you, that reveals you to yourself, that purifies you and makes you new, a new creation. I did need that film to remind me of what was human and eternal and to stop chasing after phantoms. I needed to be reminded not just of my problem, but of the ways that God has brought about so much good through that problem. So, for instance, the film helped me see that naturally down, as much as I'm drawn to the sensory world, the music, film, the arts, the outdoors, social interaction, I'm frequently driven into myself by my hearing loss. So, as social as I might be, I'm also pretty introspective. And I think that's because I had to be. I think a lot in very verbal, almost argumentative terms. If you could get inside my head, there's a constant conversation going on between me and myself and often with God, so much so that I wonder if there's really much difference between the two. To me, that's almost what prayer is for me. It's that constant running conversation. Though I would very much love to hear perfectly I can see how my lifelong handicap has shaped me into a thinking and imaginatively empathetic person, and I wouldn't have that constant internal conversation without the years of it being forced on me. And friends, I wouldn't trade that. I don't know how I would be me without it. And so the prophet Isaiah told us, in repentance and rest you will be saved, and in quietness and trust is your strength. Quietness and trust. Or the words of the Apostle Paul, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now tomorrow, if you're able to come back, we're going to explore this a little deeper. But here's the concept. Time really is a gift. But many times it can feel like a tyrant. Now I know deep in my bones when the trauma hits and time warps out and we lose our sense of the specifics of the world or how or why we're in it and all our essential connections are rendered tenuous and when we so desperately want to attach ourselves to people but we find ourselves completely alienated and we wonder if we have a future, even there there's a friend who's closer than a brother. And there's an eternity that's not subject to all those rules And it at once transcends and unfolds all of time in a great embrace, past, present, and future. In quietness and trust ultimately is your strength. We're often bewildered, but we're never lost in that flow of time. Thanks. You're very kind. Thank you for letting me share myself with you. Thank you for listening so well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for naming us. 
Thank you for knowing us before the foundations of the world. We see now how important it is that you hold us because we can't hold ourselves. Forgive us of the ways that we've failed and thank you for loving us even when we've failed. Deliver us from the anxiety of having to control everything in front of us, to manage all our relationships, to keep up appearances. Deliver us from trying to control time and the circumstances that are beyond us. Empower us and strengthen us to face the day ahead. Reassure us that we are not lost in the flow of time. Give us presence and heal us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, friends.